Inspiration and Insights from Frontline Ministry to the Nations is a podcast of Wheaton College, Illinois that features Wheaton College graduate school alumni, primarily Billy Graham scholars around the world. They share stories of God's activity in their lives and where they serve. The title reflects the nature of Jesus, the Son and Word of God being sent to the nations, and His followers also being sent to the nations. Please let us know you're listening by engaging on social media. Like, follow, share, subscribe, and comment. You can find us on wheaton.edu slash listen, and most places podcasts are found. For scholarship information for Wheaton College Graduate School, please visit wheaton.edu slash Billy Graham Scholarships. Hello, my name is April McLaughlin. I'm the Billy Graham Scholarship Program Coordinator here at Wheaton College Graduate School in Wheaton, Illinois. Thank you for listening. This interview was held in person with Dr. Pastor Tyron Laws. He earned his MA in Biblical Exegesis from Wheaton with the help of the Billy Graham Urban Ethnic Ministry Award graduating in 2010. He has about 15 years of pastoral experience in the Auburn, Gresham, and West Pullman areas of Chicago. He's also a writer, editor, instructor, father, and husband. He earned his Ph.D. in Biblical Studies at Wheaton last year. This is the second half of our interview. To hear more about the Peace Project in the wild 100s of Chicago, please listen to the podcast before this one. You're really on the front lines, Tyron, in your ministry, and you've also done this so much education. You know the Bible. You know your theology. So when you put all that together... I'm sure there's some areas where there's a tension, yeah. and there's some areas where your experience absolutely confirms what you see in the Bible. Absolutely. So, do you have thoughts on both yeah. of those? Yeah, that's, it's such a great question. As I'm researching and studying and things that matter, I'm, I always have certain questions that my context, that my social location raises. The tools that I gleaned in academy helps me to answer. And so in that way, they're kind of an integral part of one another. So let me just ask you, so yeah. your ministry maybe had some questions that popped up to you, like you were wrestling with some theological questions from your ministry, and then that would go into, well, I got to study that, I got to understand from the biblical languages what the answer to my question is, is that what you So let me back up. Now I'm speaking as an African-American Christian pastor, scholar pastor. There's a level of distilling that I think that a lot of African-American students have to do in private white Christian institutions anyway. There's just cultural differences. When we're coming to information and trying to discern what's relevant, Hebrew Israelitism, I've written a, a book on on this, uh, the, the round table, mar- marginal conversations. I can't remember the title. Marginal conversations with black. Oh my goodness. Like I don't know my, <laughs> don't know my name in my book. Uh, Christian's conversation with marginal uh, beliefs affecting the black church experience. So one of those marginal beliefs. It's, is- it's Hebrew Israelitism. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so Hebrew Israelism is essentially, first and foremost, it is a response to racism. It is an attempt to assimilate an identity for black people who feel like they have lost a sense of identity in America. This is actually kind of an underlining theme in all of what we call in the urban apologetics community, uh, black religious identity cults. It's a search for identity. It's a need to restore black dignity in which one of, has been one of the consequences of, of racism in America, the, the loss of a sense of the Imago Dei. And so first and foremost, it's a, a need in a search for black identity, but it's a, it's a search for black identity by in many ways co-opting Jewish identity. Jewish identity is a very diverse ethnic. You have, you know, you know, Ashkenazi Jews that are more of European descent. You have Mizraki Jews or Middle Eastern. Um, you have Sephardic, where it's just Middle Eastern, North African. And so there's a kind of a diversity. But even in America, um, sometimes, you know, we can talk about like white Jesus or the Europeanizing of the Jewish, the Jewish identity has been a problem. In many ways, Hebrew Israelitism is a response to that. It is a, a way of accumulating the Jewish identity, so food laws, the honor and the authority of the Torah, but also saying, hey, you know what? 
Um, when you look at, like, for example, one of their go-to scriptures is Deuteronomy 28. When you look at some of what the scriptures speak about, the curses and the challenges that will happen to the Israelites when they fall away from God, the black people's story in America, you know, fits that very well. And there are a lot of overlaps there. It's a response to racism, but it's also Hebrew Israelite is a theodicy. It is a way of trying to address the problem of evil, particularly as it relates to black people in America. And their response to that, their answer to that is, well, guess what? We are really the chosen people. We're not African. We're not African. We are We are of the chosen. And there, there's a very intricate system of, of trying to, and it isn't, they start with Deuteronomy 28 because there's a lot of things that could be, you know, that you can look at Deuteronomy 28 and look at overlap with African-American community in America. Deuteronomy 28, I think verse 68 talks about how you'll be on ships to be sold on ships be sold into slavery and all the kind of different things. And so they hijack that, that type of context. My Wheaton education is not necessarily giving me answers to that. Specific tools. But they are giving me tools, tools. And that's the thing. So you can think. That's through. right. So I have to do my own work. Oh. I have to discern and distill from what I get in classes. If we're talking about Augustine, and talk, I have to do my own work still. Um, and so I have to, in many ways, study kind of twice over. Even while I was here doing my PhD, I was also reading books. I made it my business to read books particularly geared to the African-American context, stuff about institutional racism, stuff about you know Esau Macaulay's book and you know, how, those type of things. A lot of African-American students have to do that. Like we have to, we're not just studying this, but if we're gonna stay relevant to our communities, we actually have to do the extra legwork. But the tools can be translated to any context. And that's the importance of the Billy Graham scholarship. That's the importance of the urban ministry or the international uh, scholarships that Billy Graham is that we are hopefully creating scholars. And which is why one of the things with the Billy Graham scholarship is that they return back to their context. And hopefully we are creating a context where I don't have to choose. I can be a part of Wheaton and consider this just as much as my community, as much as the South side of Chicago. But hopefully that it is creating a context where that type of theology and that type of embracing the openness of me bringing questions from my social location, infusion with the tools that I've gleaned here and to go back. There are always going to be some symbiotic things. I'm going to learn something from Wheaton and I'm going to glean something from Wheaton and Wheaton's going to glean something from me. But hopefully in a sense that that I can do it in such a way, infuse it within my identity and in my ministry and my context that I'm still relevant and not irrelevant because sometimes that happens. Whether it's international students coming to the States and then becoming westernized yeah, and then, and then they, yeah, and so they are no longer, they no longer, yeah. or in the urban context, coming and taking more of a suburban, European, no Western American kind of whatever, white evangelical, there's a white evangelical context, event, white evangelical context, there's a black evangelical context. We share the same suppositions about scripture, we share the same suppositions about a lot of stuff, but hopefully the symbiotic nature of my encounter can be as such that I'm more equipped for my context and not less, less equipped. Mm -hmm. One of the phrases I saw in your bio is this urban theology. Yeah. So that sounds like what yeah. you're sort of getting into yeah. and sort of explaining to us. Yeah. Because that was one of my questions. How yeah. do you define urban theology? Yeah. Is it the perspective? Is it the perspective yes. that you look at your study of God? I think so. Um, but that perspective arises out of a social location. So if, if I can explain it this way, all of us have biases. All of us have a social mm -hmm. context that informs our worldview, our world view, what questions are relevant, all of these different things. And so I, I would say urban theology is theology from the urban context. Theology from the urban context is shaped by questions that arise out of that context. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, as an as evangelical Christian, the Bible is our ultimate authority. It is the supreme authority. And so we have to go to the Bible for our answers. But we might, depending on our social location, come with different questions. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, you know, in, in my private white Christian institution, and I love Wheaton, but you're not always asking the questions that I'm asking. And so I, I learned then to say, okay, how can I take these tools? Mm -hmm. 
and apply it in that context. In a nutshell, that's it is it is to take the challenges and the questions of the urban context as the impetus for doing theology. That's urban theology. It's not unique to African American theology, but it obviously you know you, there's white Christians and other uh, Korean Christians in an urban context, so they also would be doing urban theology. And so maybe urban theology is kind of the the broader umbrella. And so under that you could have what does it look like to be a predominantly white church and do urban theology? What does it look like to be a white Christian and align yourself with a black church and do urban theology? Like there's no so there's all kind of little subcategories under, under there. Just to kind of give you another example, our uh, neighborhood, first of all, our neighborhood is about, it's been a few years since I checked, but last time I checked, maybe five, six years ago, 87% transient living residents. 87%. 87%. Yeah. So that means, so you're talking about, when you're talking about trying to build stability. And what is, how short term is transient? So every two years, our uh, neighborhood changes. Every two years. That's a difficult thing when you're talking about discipleship, when you're talking about evangelism, when you're even talking about social stability. We don't have many homeowners. And so whether it is migrant workers or Section 8 poverty stricken folks or my neighborhood has one of the highest heroin addiction rates although that's now there's what suburbs are starting to experience some of this too so i have to double check the check the numbers but you have all of these things that contribute to people not being able to be grounded discipleship looks different in that context evangelism looks different trying to build a children's ministry oh my goodness the challenges that comes with this the strain that it that it has on churches and on pastors that's a different context and so trying to figure out how to be relevant so one of the things then in practice urban theology has to be a comprehensive i'm in the schools we've adopted a school i i show up and we're praying in the halls in the schools i'm now looking to try to see if i can get a substitute license so that i can because the need is there we have to talk about issues of racism in a context where it requires a comprehensive kingdom outlook we're doing home buyer workshops i'm also now just to give you another example so i'm doing bible study where we're going through the book the color of the law which kind of talks about systemic issues of um, how african americans have been in many ways robbed and defrauded in the real estate area um this is new york best time seller so we're looking at that and it's really an integrative i have essentially the bible in one hand and the color law in another, and we are doing integrative. That's what urban theology looks like. I have to give voice to these needs. And what I tell my church, first, let's make it clear, positivity is not always equal to Christianity, right? We know that. Sometimes in our culture, in our postmodern milieu, people want to conflate them. They're not the same. But at the same time, I, I tell my church, if there's anything that's positive for our neighborhood, the church ought to be at the center of it. In a context where people are so anti, becoming increasingly anti-church, anti-Christian, we are experiencing this big exodus of millennials and young adults from the black church going into these black religious identity cults. We need to be able to give answers to these things. We need to be able to say, what is the church's response to racism? Does the church have anything to, anything to say about migrant issues? And like, these are not just social issues. These are kingdom issues that are affecting Thing, not just non-Christians, but black Christians who live in these neighborhoods, Latino Christians that live in these neighborhoods. When your social context doesn't have these issues, it's easy then to dismiss these things as social issues. But in my context, they're actually, there's, it's kingdom issues. This is the one of the things, this is one of the challenges with America still being a very largely segregated society, right? April is a Christian and Tyron is a Christian, but the issues that we experience have very little to do with like Christian persecution. But I can affect, although there are some things, there are some things with, you know, some legal things that we dealing with or whatever. But as a black Christian, I experience much of the same things. Now as a black Christian pastor that lives in my neighborhood, there's no difference between what they experience oftentimes what I experience. People don't know, unless I'm, unless I'm in West Pullman, where police officers know me. I've had experiences. I can share many of experiences. When I'm not in my neighborhood, I'm, nobody knows I'm Pastor Laws. I'm just a black man. They, they don't know I'm, they don't even know I'm Dr. Laws now. They don't know I have a PhD. They don't know those things. They know all they see is a black man that's six foot, that whatever that has. And, and so there's, there are things that I experience 
because of my social location. If we abdicate, if the church abdicates that responsibility to fill that gap, then you're leaving opportunity for these cults and for these other, in, in some cases, politicians that don't always have the best interests. Like the church has to be the center of it. And that's at the foundation of urban theology. It's a comprehensive theology that looks at the various needs and the various sectors of people and says, what does it look like for Christ to be infused in this context? Yeah. Yeah. Tyron, that's, you've just overwhelmed me, ah, I look guess, at this. Yeah. because yeah. I think of your fighting for good theology yeah. is, is what I'm hearing you yeah. say. And you're fighting for good education. Yeah. You're fighting against violence. Yep. You're you're you you're doing everything like yeah. you said comprehensive yep. that's yep. more than anyone can do yeah right yeah. so do you how do you raise up leaders in this context and yeah. do you have enough leaders and this is a good question like cuz you can't yeah. there's no way you, one path yeah. just the pastor can yeah. do that yeah. and care for your own flock yeah. and what do you this is this is such a great question it's such an insightful question we need help. That, that's one of the ways that I think that bigger churches, even bigger churches in the city, there, there's big African-American churches. But the thing is this, that in the city, they're facing the same issues. They're trying to, you know, they're trying to address the same issues. But one of the things that I think that like for some of our listeners in urban areas and we need workers, we really, I need people that Maybe some Wheaton students. I already know that I know they have great theology. I know they have, you know, that they've done their homework. They're studied. Obviously, it's not that we don't have a quality Christian education. I also went to Wheaton. I got. I've, I'm trained too. I'm formal, but I need. I need somebody who can um, serve as a Sunday school teacher who can help develop a children's ministry. One of the challenges of our church is very small. We have about 25 people and most of them are senior citizens. And we've done stuff like summer STEM workshops. We've done, instead of doing vacation, regular vacation Bible school, we've had to do like these amped up things. But we need younger workers. We need people. And that's a challenge too. See, we're, and no slight to my friend, Charlie Dates. That's my, he's a good friend of mine. But it's, it's easier to go to Charlie's church where... I mean, it's 3,000 people. Maybe you can sit in the pew. You can sit in a pew. It's a very, it's a it's a well-oiled machine. Bronzeville area is a little bit more stable than my West, the West Pullman area. You can get on the, the train and it lets you off like right in front of, like he's right in front of the White Sox Stadium. So you can commute in. You can commute. And this, and this is what happens sometimes is that the big churches and mega churches get, they get all the gifts. They get all the people. You know, you want to say, you know, I want to be connected with every ministry and and like I said, no slight to my brother. I love, no, Charlie, we've been in community meetings together. But he get pastors who've retired go to his church. He has he has people who've been senior pastors and other positions. They're now on helping him. But we, we need help over West Pullman. Do lots of little churches work together? Because I admit, we, Tyron, yeah. okay, I confess. Yeah. I did Google Maps. Yeah. I drove around your church. Did you? Get you? Okay, look at you. Look at and you. There's like a little church on every we have, block almost. So we have a, what's up with that? Yeah, so we have 102 <laughs> churches really? in the 60628 zip code. Really? Yeah. Okay. So, so just to just to right. get little just to complicate fronts, it, right? yeah, little storefronts, yeah, small congregations, small, yeah. some big, some you know, but a hundred, hundred and two. Do y'all work together? So or is that difficult. No, we do work. So the thing is, like the peace campaign, are opportunities for us to work together. But see, the the work is so big. Yeah. The, when we're working together, it's usually. The outreach stuff. And I'll brag on us. We, the city, the mayor has been, I've been in meetings with the mayor and with others. They you know the fifth district, they'll even say, yeah, what, what you guys are doing over there is a little different. You know, like they're, we're kind of a model for the city. We're doing collaborative efforts, trying to get non vited offenders records exonerated. We're doing free haircuts. The work is just massive. Mm -hmm. and, and that's mostly just outreach. Now the thing is too, we also have just like other, just like churches in Wheaton and whatever. There's denominational differences and stuff like that. So there's going to be a limit to our working together, mm -hmm. and we figured out that the sweet spot is, of course, this outreach. We can all come together for outreach 
in evangelism. But when it comes to specific and unique needs of our church, we need yeah, we need hard we enough help. just yeah. to maintain yeah. your your church functioning. Yeah, sure. yeah. But like with the schools, do you know that every school is covered by a church? Like adopted, no, you said you adopted. We adopted a, church, a, school. a school. A school. I wonder if other churches so are doing the same thing. So yeah, so every we, school could get adopted. So we just found out some churches in our network has adopted it's three other schools in our district has been adopted. I know Charlie has adopted a school, and I mean, there's so much red tape with the schools now. Now they're just kind of like whatever y'all just come in and do whatever you know kind of thing so it's a so we're actually also praying about trying to get some bible clubs started i did some of this work when i was in birmingham the lord is answering our prayer with revival and he's given us access into a lot of uh venues but again so much of that work is outreach centered if our school systems are failing that means that our children having issues reading their the academics like even before we can get to Bible study, there's some of these issues that have to be addressed. And then, of course, in my particular neighborhood, if, you know, my first year at the church, we had we had maybe 80 kids in our vacation Bible school. Wow. Yeah. I baptized that first year about 60 people, oh. adults and kids. But if my neighborhood changes every two years, the chances that those people that I've preached to have joined my church, that they will be there, is slim. Move to another part of the city, yeah. join a different church, or don't join a different church. It's, it's a difficult. And it's, discipleship just doesn't happen like microwaving exactly. discipleship. <laughs> exactly. So you, you probably pour into people, yep. and then they leave, pour into people, and then yep. they leave. Maybe they're going off and blessing other churches somewhere. We've had those scenarios where we've had young adults. We've had young adults start businesses. When I talk about comprehensive, we're really thinking about your, your upward social mobility. And if you're in a context where you're already experiencing the benefits of that, you may not necessarily see the need of it, but that's ministry too. We had a, a ministry for single moms. And we had a influx, I think it was maybe 2015 to 17, right before I started the, prog the, the program. Uh, we just had kind of this influx of single moms joining our church. They were struggling economically. So we created a ministry, our mom's ministry. It was an acronym for making our moms spiritually and socially stronger. My wife is a pharmacist, an underrepresented or underutilized profession is the, the pharmacy tech. Uh, she's the pharmacist, but the pharmacy tech, pharmacy tech, all you do is pay a license Pay some money and you can and you can get a career where you're getting benefits. You can get you no know, pay twenty five, thirty. You no, know, in some cases thirty dollars an hour. So we that's what we start doing. So we started training them, but we had at least two to finish it. One is actually in the program, and one did something else. We did that. Like you no, know, we're gonna train you, help you pass the test, get you trying to get you placed somewhere. So we're doing what Chicago State, a university, is doing. We need help, though. We need people who are gifted. And so, so sometimes bringing a vision. Long yeah, term would yeah, be great. Right? Absolutely. Long term investment. Absolutely. Absolutely. So if someone wanted to contact you, Tyron, how sure. would they? Sure. So you can, I'm on Facebook, Tyron Laws. I'm on Twitter. You can email me, tyron.laws at gmail. Spell Tyron. Yeah, T-Y-R-A-N. Laws Ty sounds just, it's yeah. spelled just the way it is. That's sounds. right. Text me, you know, 630-881-8024. You know, say, hey, heard about you, want to be involved. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's great. And then did you have a book or resource recommendation for people who might be interested in the subject that we talked about? You talked about some of these. So my book, The Roundtable, A Christian's Conversation with Marginal Beliefs, Eric Mason's book, uh, Urban Apologetics, and then An Icing on the Cake of the Color of the Law would be three mm -hmm. books I would mm -hmm. recommend for anybody just kind of wanting to get into some of the stuff that, that we're talking yeah. about. Yeah. You might have piqued pe pe people's interest yeah. in some of these topics yeah. Yeah. and enlightened us who didn't haven't had that experience. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, I appreciate your time, Tyron. And congratulations again on thank your doctorate. You. Thank you. And doing that while you were full-time pastoring, yeah. I just can't imagine doing that. It was a pleasure. really appreciate, appreciate yeah. this time. Thanks for your time. Tyron gave us a primer on urban theology. He listed many needs encountered on the south side of Chicago and asks, what does it look like for Christ to be infused in this context? What a great question for all of us to ask. What needs are clamoring in your context in which you can be a channel for the Lord? 
Join us next time in Kenya to hear from Miriam Smith about Eden Thriving, a ministry that touches education, agriculture, poverty remediation, youth camps, entrepreneurship, and environmental restorative projects. I believe this is the prayer needed for this time, Ephesians 1, 17 through 19. May the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe.